and 7 with Jonathan Ross previews the latest releases in 45 minutes here on BBC One. But before that, with unprecedented access to the RAF on combat operations, strong language as one life goes above enemy lines. Afghanistan is a beautiful, beautiful country. I dread to think what they think as I go over their compound or their herd of goats at 50 feet going about my business. But again, you don't think too hard about it because around the corner there'll be a whole bunch of them wanting to shoot you out of the skies. When you see Tracer coming up at you or when you see explosions going off near to you, bloody hell, it's scary. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't believe it, don't start screaming like a girl, to be honest. <laughs> These are the men of 27 Squadron from RAF Odium in Hampshire. They're here in Afghanistan at the start of their eight-week deployment. It was from this remote and hostile country that Osama bin Laden planned the 9-11 attacks. Its Taliban rulers fled in the aftermath, but five years on, they're back in force. Please pay particular attention to your service number and also your next of kin details. It's very, very important we get your next of kin details correct. For the next two months, these 26 men will be flying Chinook helicopters in and out of the front line, delivering troops and supplies and evacuating the injured. Right from the start, squadron leader Ian Diggle is thrown straight in at the deep end. Um, it's going to put us coming into the objective area from the south and west. I'm the flight commander of, uh, of this motley crew that we've got out here. I'm the sort of boss. And um, tonight we have been tasked to go and conduct what they call a rip, a relief in place of troops and kit out of Sangin. And it's always been fairly hot down there, but the, the enemy are fairly convinced they want to hold on to that, and we are fairly convinced that we don't want them to. So that place is um, interesting, and I use the word interesting as a euphemism for quite dangerous. Get your height down early, there's going to be an IR strobe on the compound here. The small town of Sangin is a notorious Taliban stronghold. For weeks, British forces there have been locked in fierce battles, and the squadron's first mission will be to deliver them ammunition and fresh troops. The plan is simple, but dangerous. Ian Diggle's fleet of three helicopters will be taking the Taliban by surprise flying straight into the British base in Sangin under cover of darkness. Each Chinook is loaded with supplies, ammunition and reinforcements. Have we got some exterior NVG formation lights on? Uh, yes, we have. Blim and two. Eyes out, guys, back towards the... Uh... As the helicopters come into range of Taliban guns, British troops on the ground must protect them from attack by bombarding the enemy positions with artillery fire. Yeah, pre-fire's going in right one. Yeah, pre-fire's going in north of the compound. And south, very close. 40 knots. The fly down the river valley at Sangin at night whilst the guys are still trying to get rounds onto you is it's, uh, it's quite challenging stuff. Lost the trees. Okay. Keep going forward 40. Two tall trees across. I'm going to necessarily walk across forward at 30. Coming down. Top five. Four. Three. Two. One. Well on the ground. Low gone. Clear by the river. Bring forward. Clear forward. The last place you really want to be in a helicopter is just sat there. The Chinook is a big noisy target that can attract anything to shoot at it. We don't like to be on the ground for a long time when it's all going a bit banzai around you. Like loads of rounds going out of the compound. How are you guys? Just not getting the trip under the fucking loader down. 55 seconds. Come on, come on, come on. 
Thirty seconds, boss. Okay. Hurry up. Adam's still on the deck. I'll yep. keep you posted. Okay, that's it. Right, plenty of bad. Nineteen percent. The right, ninety-five. With the Taliban now fully aware of their recent visitors, the bombardment begins again to protect the convoy as it returns home. Good heading. Uh, good heading there. Back on left slightly now. 10 degrees. Oh, that fire's a grand for those. Main threat, 3 o'clock now. Roger. In all. Good work, fellas. What well up, guys? Peace, peace. Home, sweet home. For the next eight weeks, this is where the squadron will live. An air-conditioned porter cabin between the runway and the sewage works at Kandahar Airfield. Can we have a sort of exec room in here to start with? Most of the men have flown countless sorties in Iraq, Bosnia and Afghanistan. Still some familiar posters there. It's a lifestyle that pilots like Jockey have had to get used to. I'm not a brilliant academic. I never ever shone at school, I never shone at university or anything like that, but I knew I wanted to join the Air Force, so I knew I wanted to be a pilot in the first place when I was a kid, when I was very young, so 12, 13 years old. And I just pursued it all the way through sort of school and university. And then joined the Air Force seven years ago. I don't really know what we expected to be doing, but it certainly wasn't out here flying in these sort of operations. We get some flowers or some plants. For 27-year-old Dan Padbury, this tour in particular will have a whole new set of challenges. I'm a relatively new pilot, relatively baby pilot. I finished training just over a year ago, I, just before we came out here, I got my combat ready uh, status, if you like, which means that I can be a captain out here. The responsibility of going out for the first time, being the captain of the aircraft, making all the decisions, um, using the crew effectively and making sure that we don't, you know, balls up so that they lose confidence in us. Um, I'm looking forward to, to, the, to that, although I think there will be some extra pressure and stress involved as well. Right, guys, two minutes. Um, the main effort at the moment is to keep the flying going. Okay, so what they were thinking was a nine o'clock start at sort of nine o'clock, is that doable? Yeah. Not on the thrash shoot. Yeah. Just be careful your dress. We had a few snide sideways jabs from the army types about um, t shirts such as that. Um, if you're in the headquarters, don't wear a gash t shirt. It's either a jacket over your t shirt or no t shirt and a jacket. So, uh, <coughs> The heavily protected airfield at Kandahar is home to 12,000 multinational troops from a NATO coalition of 37 different countries. It's quite surreal when you look at it. The luxuries we have here, it's definitely the Americans and the Canadians that produce that sort of thing for their people. I think if we compared it to uh, what our grandfathers fought in the Second World War or something like that, or, or even great grandfathers in the First World War, their, their sort of version of what a war's like. It would be completely different from sitting out on the veranda drinking a cappuccino at night time and having a slice of pizza. I think there's more coffee shops than there are in Guildford. There's Pizza Hut, there's Burger King. It's not really like being away on operations. I would describe it as a very low budget university halls of residence. And um, we've got a you know, bathroom, shower room at the end of the corridor, so that's all really good. So, generally speaking, we can't really complain. It's 5 a.m. Dan and fellow pilot Phil have been tasked with flying much needed supplies to frontline troops all over Helmand province. The Taliban's use of improvised bombs has made travel by road increasingly dangerous. These days, most movements of supplies in Afghanistan are done by air, making the Chinooks a lifeline to troops on the ground. The first task this morning is taking four and a half tons of equipment to the frontline base at Lashkar Gar. 
There is no average day, I'd say. Every day is very different out here. Potentially, we can be flying for 12, 14 hours before we next have a rest. Um, it, it really can go from one extreme to another. You could be doing nothing, bored, but sometimes you are just so focused, so busy, doing lots of flying, getting shot at, some very dangerous circumstances. Few places on earth have seen as many wars as Afghanistan. It's a land where farmers carry Kalashnikov rifles, and there are daily reports of machine guns and rocket propelled grenades hidden in the hills, just waiting to be used against a passing aircraft. Each Chinook is armed with three high powered machine guns, and they must always be escorted by an Apache attack helicopter loaded with Hellfire missiles. Despite its rugged beauty, this remains one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Dan Padbury, known as Padders, is one of the few single men in the squadron. It's a dating website up the creek without padders. Body type, mm. I put athletic, I'm working on it. I say I'm stretching the truth there a little bit. Seven girls have put me on their favorite list so far. What worries me more is their combined weight. <laughs> Not that's necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> In this heat, I think a Chinook would struggle. If I'm writing like a, an opening gambit, say there's a girl on there that I think looks pretty cool. So I write her just the opening line, the first point of contact. I'll try and write something witty and funny because I know that chances are, you know, every man and his dog's already tried to write her. So I'll try and come up with something new, witty, funny. What do I get? I get people who write Hi, fancy a chat? Six days after the resupply at Sangin, the squadron have been summoned by the commander of all British helicopters, Colonel Neil Sexton. Right, sir, ladies and gentlemen, settle down, please. Sit up and stand up in the back. Um, the light of the land has changed slightly. Sangin has got no better. Musa Kala is out of bounds. Now, Zad, we always get shot. The American Air Force are about to launch a series of massive air and ground assaults to crush the Taliban in Sangin. I will just go through this and explain all of the different friendly force elements that make up this plan, which is several thousand people. This is the biggest uh, operation that's happened uh, since well before Christmas. We cannot afford to lose an aircraft here. It would be a strategic disaster, whether it's empty with just your four bodies on board or whether it's full with 25 or 30 people with their burgers in the back. The loss of an aircraft here would be a disaster. These will be the biggest air assaults since the war began. In addition to their fleets of up to 24 aircraft, the US Air Force have asked for British Chinooks to join them for the night missions into the Sangin Valley. Squadron leader Ian Diggle is learning that the Americans do things differently. With more aircraft comes a lot more planning. I appreciate there's not many of us here. Watsi is still down with the Americans now after a two hour and 20 minute brief about this job tomorrow night. He's now going through rehearsals. Um, my crew stay in bed until after lunch. If the colonel starts getting a hess on, just say, look, we are flying late tomorrow night. We're only be flying for about an hour and a half, two hours, so it's not going to be that bad. But the way this American briefing system goes, you know, we might start briefing in the morning for this. Actually, our piece in this is very simple. It's just an incredibly complicated plan the Americans put together. Any questions? Or any, any alibis? As the Americans say. Well, this is a dedicated operation with massive amounts of air power, massive amount of ground troops, and there's there's no doubt in my mind that we will see some, well, we'll see a big fireworks show. 
this op, no one knows we're coming in. It's a secret, this one. So we've got the people where we want them. They can't escape. They can't hide in tunnels. It's just fields and compounds. So we're going to go in at night, making lots of noise, to basically attack these people while they're in position, unlike previous ops. So I think this is very, very different. It's probably more dangerous. Um, they'll hear us coming for a while. They'll want to defend themselves because they'll be shitting themselves because there's a lot of high-ranking Taliban there. We need to make sure that we don't get caught up in the American plan of flying in straight and level at crazy speeds, like going slow or high or from strange angles. So I think our job is to get the RAF snooks in and back out safely. The first assault will begin at one minute past midnight. Over 1,000 American ground troops will be flown into the remote poppy fields surrounding Sangin. From there, they will enter the town on foot to capture or kill the Taliban fighters who control it. Remember, everyone that's on this aircraft for a little bit longer, this thing's on the ground, big noisy fucking target, bright moon tonight, so off, out, away, go to ground, and that's everyone in the aircraft and get off, get to a safe position, and we haven't got the usual 15 minutes, everyone's standing at the ramp fucking about. If you do start feeling sick, I don't know if you, any of you get air sick, no point in sitting there and fucking spewing over the person in front of you and upsetting everyone before we get into the site where we need to be, uh, it goes with any other problems. Let someone know if there's a problem. Well, I think that's uh, everything I need to discuss. It's, uh, if you want to go and start going through some of your drills now, just load them all off. Load it up. Okay. Um, we're going to land on the HLS, and I'll just show you how we're here now. Dan will be in the lead UK aircraft, with Jockey just behind him. For example, the middle of line of sight, that objective is 56 metres. For some of these American troops, this will be the biggest operation of their careers. Where are you going? Um, actually, I'm not too, too clear on all that. Um, I don't, like, I'm not good with the names around here and everything. Um, hey, Schofield, where, whereabouts are we going? Sanjin. Well, might as well put my book away. Just gonna do some work then. I've been looking forward to this since I found out that we were gonna be doing it. Um, and all the briefings we've had over the last few days have really sort of multiplied that feeling. But it's still a few nerves, but um, don't want to fuck up, obviously. Uh, but no, also, time's moving on, so I better get strapped in the front. Okay. Right, that's uh, we're up next, boys. Get out of ground, Hawk 6-6, they're going to fly on. Lifting. Look, I've armed the Hawk. Keep flying. 0 2 6 are you guys ready? G-Mash, you've got 1-5-6, you're going down, aren't you? Self-defense is all good. There's 175 feet there, thanks, mate. Watch you just go to his fucking line and lay off. Should we tell him? Just confirm your line settings. Oh, this is American, but he's telling yeah, it. Yeah, Guys, my main concern for the moment until the landing site, biggest issue for us is going to be across the heart of darkness, because we'll be the third big package to go across there. Roger that, With all 27 aircraft in the air, it's now a 40-minute transit to the landing site. Ray Kelly, or Natasha Kaprinsky. Kaplinski. I think I'm leaning towards... Fuck off, that's a made up one. I think I'm leaning towards Lorraine Kelly. Natasha, oh. we love you not as much as I love Sophie Rayworth. I like the girl that's doing the BBC uh, Morning News. Yeah, moment. I like her as well. Um, Kate Middleton. I think she's really nice. Kate Middleton, that's Prince William's girlfriend, isn't it? I'll tell you who else I like is the Sky News weather girl in the morning. Yeah, she's nice. There's one little snag with Kate Middleton. Uh, okay, jockey. you're descending there, mate. Descending. Okay, 200 feet again. 12 miles outside Sangin, the lead American aircraft starts coming under heavy enemy fire. Is that tracer or contact, boys? Stand away. Minimize comms. Tracer. Tracer, Roger. Two five. We had heavy contact. Uh, one one six o'clock. We're invading. Good. Over. Three minutes to the next turn point. And then from there, boys, it'll just be. I'll just follow it all the way down. Fox Mike. Turn mine down. Target is left. Eleven o'clock. Range two miles. One minute. Clear the truth now. Full gun. Be better. Ground 
With hundreds of troops being inserted into the region over the coming weeks, it's not long before the Taliban start fighting back. We're not well placed this slow and this light and this battle rotary. 71 arrow, 24. The fucking RPG flash, so that wasn't very nice. Yeah, I saw the, uh, I saw it explode behind us, that's what uh, I saw. Two rocket propelled grenades, or RPGs, narrowly missed Dan's helicopter, and the crew is convinced that they've been hit by small arms fire. As the following Chinook flies over the RPG launch site, it unleashes a barrage of machine gun fire. I see no holes. And he saw, said he saw the muzzle flashes, and then he heard a couple of pops come from the bottom of the aircraft. I don't know whether we put we were quite low and actually over the compound. He may have heard the actual you know, rifle drop and. Despite machine gun fire and RPGs, all the aircraft have returned home almost unscathed. Somebody's upchucked to my fucking aircraft. Bastard. Some horrible American. If you've got British paratroopers, good as gold, they're always, they're always sick in their helmets, but obviously Americans don't know any attacks. Anyone who ever says our job is anything to do with Top Gun, look at that, mate. It's not quite as glamorous as that. All about vomit, shitty desert. That says it all, really. Do you like your job, Dave? Has its fringe benefits. <laughs> This is probably the most attractive person that's put me uh, down as one of their favourites. There she is. Very nice. Stunning, in fact. She says she does have a preference for uh, the types of guys she goes for. Obviously, loads of guys have already emailed her, so you've got to do, write something a little bit different in order to get noticed. This is the way that I figure it. So I then wrote to, um, uh, to, to break the ice. Uh, Hi, Steph. I'm a little nervous sending this as I only seem to match one of your specifications at the moment. Uh, my sense of humour is second to none. My looks are, um, well, have a look for yourself. I'm no hunchback of Notre Dame, though. As for my bod, just give me six more weeks and everything will be tip-top, because obviously I'm going through my gym spree at the moment, um, including a very good tan. Uh, I won't specify if there will be tan lines or not, though. It's a little bit cheeky at the end. Um, anyway, I thought you sounded like fun, hence the little note. If you fancy having a chat, please feel free to reply. Speech is just a small visual, 11 o'clock. Quibble, good in the off. Is that crazy approaches are us? Almost. Well, it's got me. 
I mean, some of the work that we do isn't glamorous in, in the least. Last time I was here, I found myself flying at Kajaki Dam with an underslung load full of bits of wood. And I just thought, how did I get, how did I get here? It was honestly, no, it was bits of wood and it's wheelbarrows. And I thought, how glamorous is this? Associates or BMW? Uh, BMW. Jockey? Uh, Beamer, I think. Beamer. Okay, Razzler or White House? White House. White House. Yeah, White House. I'm crossing me. Well, I did all right on there, on Texas. Got chatting to two very nice girls. But this, uh, this student in London, she's doing um, biomedical science, I think. Nice. And uh, yeah, she, she had a cracking sense of humour, so happy days. Happy days. Those cracking sense of humour patterns are lit. She had a bad Little and often is my laundry mantra, but that went for a burden today when I seem to be washing practically everything I possess. pleasurable about filming a squadron leader doing his knickers. And it's fascinating as well when you take your stuff out of the laundry and there's a pair of undies in there which are definitely not mine. <laughs> Later that day, Ian Diggle receives news that an aircraft has been attacked in the Hellman Valley. Uh, we've just had a report that a Chinook has received some small arms fire and is leaking hydraulics. I'm just trying to work out A, if it's one of ours, and B, exactly where, it, where it's intending to go. And that's all we know at the moment, so we might go back to Ops, find out who it is and uh, what's happening. That is my worst nightmare if we had an aircraft downed out here. It would be, I mean, there are plans and procedures in place to recover it, but if it was a catastrophic crash, then it would just be... Not nice, not nice at all. Boss, and his crew. Um, there's been no injuries. It was a use of a hide failure from small arms and then out of back at Bastion. They're at Bastion on the ground? On the ground at Bastion, yeah. Holes in the aircraft, obviously, because it's hit the use of hides. Do you know how many holes they've got? No. Where were they? Do you know? Goresh, tier 41. It was the third time into this. Grid, which is obviously going to bring up. I mean, that's what, hap that's what happened to us the other night. Chief of staff's on it. Um, it was all heads, heads on fire about five minutes ago. He called. Right. Um, so that's why I just went to find out. No, no, that's fine. As long as on the ground and they came. Steph has finally replied to Dan's carefully worded email. Hey Padders, how are you honey? I'm having a great relaxed bank holiday, how about yourself? Steph. I was a little bit disappointed. <laughs> um, you know, after, after really, really trying to, to make her laugh and make a decent impression, I was kind of, kind of hoping for a little bit more, but uh, at least she replied, so, so that's a good thing. One crew from the squadron must always be on standby to fly emergency missions to evacuate injured soldiers from the front line. Today, it's Dan's turn on duty, and he's using the time to do some homework. Um, it's an open university degree in uh, basically religious studies and theology. It's a bit of a coincidence, I, I, I guess, that I'm in an Islamic country. Um, and I'm studying Islam, but um, as I've said to you before, you know, we're, we're detached from the local populace, we're, we're detached from the Islamic culture which is in the country, so I'm literally in, in the Western bubble, um, just, just reading about it really. It's still very early days to be honest, in terms of my learnings on, on Islam and you know, theological thinking and stuff like that. Um, doesn't it? it doesn't really affect me at the moment. I find it very interesting, and I'm certainly Others. learning a hell of a lot. Ooh. News has come in that somewhere in Helmand, a British soldier has been shot. Camera for the monkey. Am I going out to flash the camera? Oh, yeah. 
The soldier has been classified as a T1, requiring immediate treatment. We're still waiting for the nine liners to come in. OK, well, we're going to fight. Yeah. And I'll wait here for the... Yeah. whatever happens. Yeah, fantastic. Jules, we're going to go low level the whole way. Yeah, I'm yeah. It's a straight line. Oh, we'll go, Luke. Hi, boss, Sean. Yeah. You stay at low level, we'll chat later. Yeah. The T1, which is... Um, needs immediate surgery, surgical aid. Yeah, so we've got a gunshot wound, which is about 15, 20 minutes flying away. It can take us 10 to fire the cab up, so hopefully be there within 25 minutes. Okay, good, good, good. good. Right, grab the stuff, I can't reach it. Yeah. I'm going to go straight in the front, touch it up. Every minute is now crucial. Pre-flight checks on a Chinook normally take half an hour, but today it's different. Okay, that's proof, PC, I've fully forwarded flight, engaged in talk flight, it's 100% over you going to stop. Fuel's coming off, quick set of scams. Done. Done, sweet. Okay, right then, if you could just follow me through, please, somebody, the yeah. batteries on the APU, stop from 4 4 cross speed off, maybe see fully forward of flight and gated. Come to slaved instruments, direct to say, warning, flights away, tans, tack, and tack, and I have. Everything is looking good, they're ready for radars if nutty is. Yeah, Charlie 7, your side while we're doing it. Let's take the left hand turn now. Alright, just make just bonding 100%. Within 11 minutes, they're in the air, and heading straight for an ongoing firefight. Alright, we're clearing the sir, but uh, the AMP are firing the mortars. Cool. Well, we'll bear that mind. Cool, if they're firing mortars, chances are the still on going, so we'll just be in and out as soon as we can. And, um, got another funny round. Brilliant. On board is an emergency medical team, as well as a force protection unit to secure the area when they arrive. And alongside is their escort, the Apache Attack Helicopter. I'll step, we'll try and make 120 at low level. And that should sit them quite nicely at 110, because we'll be weaving, they won't. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, it's actually staying low at the moment. Okay. Just got a few tents coming down the left-hand side. The left yeah, side. I don't know. Uh, we got a couple of villages on the nose there. I'm going to go in between the two of them into the valley. Okay, I'm going to be going in between a couple of compounds for about 700 metres of time. Uh, we may stretch the Apaches if need be, we'll bring the speed back now, and then we can accelerate. Do it right out there. Accelerate back in. Low level later on. Okay. Time's gone, I just got to check. Uh, without much wind there, Nussie, if you're happy, I'll just go straight in, rather yeah. than flapping around doing any turns. Yeah, I'll sink it on the way, there's no wind at all. Straight in, and then we can come out over the shoulder if need be. Depends how yeah. close we are. There's going to be a true fire on the ground and Bolton's going from the hill, but we're going to be cleared him. Yeah, but just pass that on to two guys that will be getting off. Okay, visual with a few plumes of smoke in the 12 o'clock. That must be from the mortar rounds. Right, two and a half minutes. Despite clearly visible smoke from the nearby firefight, the crew decides to press ahead with their mission. Oh, it's still T1, has it? It's still T1, sir. Roger, one mile, I'm going to start decreasing speed. Cool. That's one mile now. Roger. Yeah, I've got women to move in. Expected smoke. Ground speed 50, good height. 45, 40, good height. Down 30, 30, 20, 15, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Half on. Half on, half on. Okay, pump brakes on. Help me make you around, clear around, clear to sound. Pump under the moment in the right to 2 o'clock. Yeah, four forward three. right. Chance that we get Dr. Moore to small arms there. With armed Taliban fighters little over a mile away, the Chinook presents an easy target. When it lifts off, it'll be in real danger of being hit by a mortar or rocket attack. Cool, but Padded, if you do it as low as you can whilst watching a radar threat, I'll call right out. It doesn't matter if you're in a dust cloud, I'll call right out. 
Yeah, we'll do, mate. And uh, we don't want to go up high because we'll get fucking zapped. That's more forward right again, that's small arm still. 19 year old Private Christopher Gray has been shot in the chest. Cool, oh, there's fresh uh, smoke again. So it's still ongoing. Happy. I'm still happy. Okay. Are you on okay? Kev? Yep. He's uh, coming through the aircraft now. Okay. Right then. Everybody happy if I lift? Yeah, go for it. Right. Right, left deck. Ramp 7 You're clear above. Thank you. Take my run out my powers. 40, 50, 60. No, sure. I'm fine. Good references. Yeah, I've got good references. Uh, 20 feet there, but I'm still good. Okay. The Chinook is soon flying straight to a British field hospital, and the medics can begin their attempt to save the young soldier. How's the guy doing down the bank? Is he still holding in? Yeah, they're in CPR at the moment. Okay. Okay, is there a chance he may be okay? We may be at a... Uh, we've, got a we've got a bit of an aircraft problem at the moment. We can either go smooth and slow or fast. Fast. Okay, cool. Faster the better, actually. Cool, we're just going to run back as fast as we can now, Paddy. Yeah, we'll the do. The AA short made their own way back. Happy. The AA's in our fifth block, half a gate high. With the soldier's health deteriorating, the crew pushes the Chinook to its maximum speed. But this means they will outrun their Apache escort and have to fly back to base completely unguarded. I think if we can squeeze a bit more out of it, it might be helpful. Speed? Yeah. Uh, we've got 145, we can pull a little bit. Yeah. I'll do what I can, mate. Yeah, see the guys in a bit. Four is on the bucket. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got about 180 going to be there. Uh, the 170, sorry. As good as we're going to get, I think. It's just been fired, mate. They're doing CPR on, on the lad. It's got to the at least as well. Okay. Okay, we're coming in at 90 degrees to 90 degrees to the spot, unlike last night. Yeah. And, and we'll turn the tail, dust allowing, towards the ambulance. Okay. Right. Just go bring the heights up a little bit. Spot the sign. Yeah, I don't know where he did a moment. It's got to be on the nose somewhere. It's on the roof. Yeah, yeah you've got it slightly left of the nose. About eight people on the ground. Wait, one o'clock. Right, one o'clock. Oh, yeah. Ambulance yeah. standing by. Hello, the fuck is still there in a circle? If you go into the three o'clock, the tail will be closest. Yeah, we'll do. Forward 40 and right descending. 30. 20. Better ahead 15. 10. 8. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Clear below now. Three, two, one. Okay, puck brakes on. Clear round, clear. Has the out. Secret stuff. There's gloves in that box, there's a box of gloves in here, we should get exposed to Shit, that isn't it? Mm. This is the odd bit. We're obviously detached from everything. Sat in the front, and certainly when we're going to dusty places, we've got the curtain across here, so you can't see what's going on in the mirrors. And it's. No. No, we don't. We just concentrate. And then after an hour or two of flying, you come back and you actually see all the stuff in the back of the cab, which obviously opens your eyes to what's actually going on rather than just hearing it on the intercom. I don't know. It's difficult to explain. I feel fucking shit if that's... Um... Yeah, mind. I'll take more. Minutes after landing, Dan and Phil learn that Private Grey was declared dead on arrival at hospital. You can be watching a fucking comedy on TV. So the next minute, be something like this. It's something, I guess, that we're all aware of and we all prepare ourselves mentally for. Certainly not, I don't know, it's not pleasant. It's not. But I think it, it's one of those things that it takes a little bit of time to sink in, if that makes sense. Give it a couple of hours. You start thinking maybe, well, I'll start thinking maybe, well, you know, we all tried our best. The medics were fucking working their, working their nuts off. Um, we flew as quickly and did everything as quickly as we could. Um, yeah, it's just shit.
I don't know about everyone else, but I just try and think about flying the aircraft and, and don't even think about what's going on down the back. They ask for updates like, is it better to go fast and bumpy or, or slow and not bumpy? So you just concentrate on getting the aircraft back here. It's kind of really weird. It doesn't weigh on me, and because all the guys have to deal with that sort of thing. Every, most people now know somebody that's been killed in, in one of the theatres or been injured or, or something like that, especially the guys on the ground. But um, I think the guys, the guys tell jokes and make light of most things, because if you don't, then it's going to be a bloody miserable time out here if you don't. And I think that's why they do it, to be honest. After seven weeks, Ian Diggle is being allowed home early to be with his fiancée for the birth of their first child. Packing to go home is uh, not too bad at all, but I'm just shocked how much stuff I've managed to collect since I've been out here. So they're going to have a bit of a uh, garage sale, Strads, in the office? You got, you got anything shiny? No, nope, but I've got a helmet full of dirty socks. I don't think she's completely aware of, of, of the levels of danger that we, uh, we get up to. And again, I wouldn't necessarily want to tell her. I, maybe when I'm drunk, when I get home, I'll spin a few stories. But no, uh, certainly not when I'm not when I'm out here. I I, I, I don't tell my fiance what I'm up to exactly. I think it would worry her unduly. So. Hello, the UK. Good evening, sir. Thanks very much. Have a good one. Nicely done. Boss. Thanks. Take care. Keep smoking. Hey, well, yeah, the, uh, you, you, you'll be great with the baby, I'm sure. <laughs> Just nappies and stuff, right? Keep it up, mate. Sure, Nicely done. Yeah, Definitely everything, isn't it? Yeah, uh, if there is anything, mate, I'll um, leave it here for you. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> Thanks, mate. See you later. Bye-bye. The next day, Dan is back on duty. Like the rest of the squadron, he has a week to go before returning to the UK. It's hard getting home, hearing people worrying about really menial shit when, you know, it could be a couple of days after after you get home. Oh, they said, what did you do last weekend? How do you explain that to people? How, how, does, it, how does it make me feel? Like, unless you're out here, you really don't know what's, what's going on. And that, to a certain extent, when you hear people making light of, of the situations out here in Iraq and stuff, they... You just can't understand it unless you're here, I think. You can sympathise to an extent, but... Yeah. Nah, it's shit. <laughs> it's shit. One Life returns in two weeks on Wednesday at 10.40 here on BBC One. Next tonight, film 2007 with Jonathan Ross. Three days ago, Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf won a landslide election. A few months ago, filmmaker Sabir Sumaf persuaded the former dictator to invite her for dinner and quizzed him and his mother about his plans. Find out what he had to say tomorrow night at 10 on BBC4. Born to be king, born to rule, born to be wild. He blows hot, he blows cold. Perhaps you could keep his interests more prolonged. Duke of Buckingham is raising an army. I would make him wish that he'd left the affairs of the state to those who were born to rule. The Tudors, Friday at 9, only on BBC Two.
It's wild, wonderful, and here. The nature of Britain. Tomorrow at nine on BBC One.